Hello, I'm Seb and I'm looking for love, so it's time once again to dedicate a video to 2000 year old poetry. Viewers of a sensitive disposition may want to turn off now because things are about to get very nerdy. For those of you who've watched my channel before, you may be aware that I have a high key obsession with the Roman poet Publius Ovidius Naso, normally known as just Ovid. And in the last big poem I read by him called Tristia, he's complaining about having been exiled um, to the Black Sea. And he makes reference several times to the reason of his exile being one, some obscure political thing which he doesn't want to go into, which has obviously been intriguing scholars for, you know, thousands of years, but we don't know what it is. And two, a collection of love poetry called the Ars Amatoria. So naturally, I was wondering the whole time through what could have been so immoral, you know, so outrageous and scandalous that the Emperor of Rome himself felt the need to exile this poet to the furthest reaches of the empire. So I did what any curious soul would do in these circumstances, and I ordered every single copy that Vancouver Public Library has of the poem to compare the English translations, pick one for myself, and read it. And that's what you see before you hear, with the exception of one. One of them actually isn't in English, it's just a Latin, but it has commentary in English, so I thought that could be good as well. So basically, in this video, um, I won't be introducing the poem since I don't know anything about it yet. Um, I'll be comparing the English translations and picking one to read. So this is less a video about the actual, well, so-called scandalous content of the poem, um, and more a video about, I guess, translations and preference in translation. Um, uh, and also, like, I guess, kind of interest in seeing how the same material has been translated through the ages, because um, obviously this poem has been around for a very long time, and English translations have been around for a while, so I thought it would be kind of interesting to compare them, because the oldest one is quite old, and the recent one is quite recent. So without further ado, let's get into the Ars Amatoria. But first of all, we have this red one which is just Ovid's Art of Love. That's how they've translated the title. Already things look very old from the kind of fonts that we're seeing and the kind of pictures that are appearing on the first pages. That, just look at that. That looks like a Shakespearean play or something. It says Ovid's Art of Love in three books together with his Remedy of Love tra translated into English verse by Feveral Eminent Hands part first, to which are added the court of love and the history of love. Why do they do that with the S and the F? I've never known. Somebody please say in the comments that, uh, you know, the F and the S thing that like old English writing people do. So yeah, this was written by John Dryden. And it says here that this is from the edition of 1776 in London. These other ones are all from the 20th century. So this is quite a big jump. There's a big gap between this and the rest. I'm pretty sure this won't be the one that I'm choosing, but it is just gorgeous. And I thought it would still be fun to, to compare to the other ones. You can see there it's translated by Mr. John Dryden, um, a poet of some renown, although I don't know if I've ever read anything by him. This one, um, it's got a really cheap looking cover, um, which is the lover, it says the lover's handbook, which I really like actually as a translation. And this was originally published in 1923 by F.A. Wright. Then we have the Loeb Classical Library edition, translated by J. H. Mosley in 1929. So very close to this one. So that'll be interesting to see how they compare. Then we have this really nice cover, The Art of Love. Um, I like it actually, it's really light as well to hold. The, the blue is really nice and it has that kind of nice, nice old smell. You know, there's like a bad old smell and a nice old smell. And look at this font, my goodness, it's amazing. It says translated by Rolf Humphreys. Um, originally 1957. Then moving on to the actual Latin one, which just says Ars Amatoria Book 1. So I don't even think it's the full poem, but it's just got loads and loads of notes. It's got like a map there, um, which shows the places that he mentions um, in the poem, which was something that I really liked about the Tristia. And some bits, it almost feels like you're getting like a guided tour of ancient Rome. Um, so I think that, that this is going to be valuable, even though I can't actually read any Latin. Also just maybe to like read out the words in comparison and get like a feel for the sound of them. Although I don't know like the stresses or like how you're, how you're supposed to read ancient Latin. And finally, the most modern one, The Art of Love, with the title covered there by the barcode. Um, I hate how they always do that. But uh, this is translated by James Michie in 2002. No, 1993, sorry, this edition, 2002. Translated 1993. So uh, this one is actually, I um, took this out ages ago and I talked about it in another video and I said how I was feeling iffy about the translation. I started reading the beginning of it and in the introduction he said he introduced rhyme even though 
rhyme isn't in the original poem and it wasn't something I think that the ancient Romans did. So that always feels kind of weird to me, like putting rhyme where rhyme wasn't originally. But um, he, he said the reason is because of its style is really witty and kind of um, almost artificial in the way that like everything seems quite neat in how he structures his couplets. So uh, the best way to translate that into English is through rhyme. That's what James Mitchie says. And just as much as I'm almost 100% sure I won't be reading the Dryden, I'm almost 100% sure I won't be reading this version because it just didn't, it just didn't gel with me when I, when I started it before. So now I've introduced all the books, it's time to get into the good stuff and get into the poetry. By the way, what seems to be the reason um, that like, like that this was so scandalous is, well, at least one big part of it is that the form of the poem is like didactic. And that was like a kind of a, a common form at the time, like teaching people how to live their life in a moral and upstanding way. But the content of the poem is to do with, you know, like, it's almost like pickup artisty kind of feeling, but or, or and I think it talks about adultery, like telling people how to become adulterers in some parts. I mean, I don't know because I haven't read it, but just from the introduction stuff and notes that I've read for other things, it seems like um, the didactic form, like the, the style of the writing and the, and the content and the gap between that made it seem like it was mocking the didactic stuff that was being said by the government at the time and that other poets were putting out, as well as promoting adultery, which was apparently a big no-no in Augustus's Rome. But anyway, um, let's get into the adultery. I think I'll begin with just like the first lines. Um, I, I don't know how far I'll go. I'll just read like a bit. These are really huge stanzas, actually. Um, let's just read a bit of, of Dryden. In Cupid's Facul, I, I won't read the Fs. I'll, I'll read them as Ss, okay. So in Cupid's school, whoever would take degree must learn his rudiments by reading me. Seamen with... Sorry, I can't read seamen with a straight face in this context as well. Um, seamen with failing arts, their vessels move. <sighs> with sailing arts. I said I wouldn't do the Fs. Seamen with sailing arts, their vessels move. Art guides the chariot. Art instructs to love. Of ships and chariots, others know the rule, but I am master of love's mighty school. That was actually really hard to read, reading all those Fs instead of Ss. I did not expect that would be the first challenge in this video. Let's move on to the Lover's Handbook. Jumping forward a few centuries, um, we'll see if we're still doing iambic pentameters and all that. It is by art ships sail the sea. It is by art that chariots move. If then unskilled in love you be, come to my school and learn to love. In, in all the process of seduction, this handbook gives you full instruction. Okay, so that's kind of a nice rhyming pattern. It's really kind of, in a way, it seems almost more artificial. That is, what's it? A, B, A, B, a C, C. Um, and I guess it goes that way all the way, all the way through the poem. It does, that's what the stanzas look like. They're much nicer in smaller, nicer chunks than the last one. But they also have that really kind of dum de dum de dum de dum like nursery rhyme kind of rhythm which I think is probably nothing to do with the original Latin uh, lyric poetry, it was called. I don't know like anything about Latin lyric poetry, but I can imagine it wasn't this. But yeah, better than Dryden. Um, so now we're gonna try the next one, also in the 1920s. Oh, okay. This is actually, got, it's got the Latin, but it's not poetry. It's prose, which means I'm probably not going to choose this one either because poetry to prose also is something that usually just doesn't sit well with me um, unless there's no other choice, right? And here I have other choices, but let's see. If anyone among these people knows not the art of loving, let him read my poem, and having read, be skilled in love. By skill, swift ships are sailed and rowed. By skill, nimble chariots are driven. By skill, must love be guided. Okay, this one's like... Yeah, kind of clearer in meaning than the other ones, I suppose. And interesting, they translate art as skill. And here it says like arte in the original Latin. So I guess, yeah, art is the, the Latin word, but maybe translates better as skill in this case. So they've, they've gone for skill instead of art. If you just want to understand what's going on, then this, this makes sense. But if you want to read a poem, then I guess it doesn't. Next up, we have Rolf Humphreys from 1957. Um, this lovely dark shade of blue. Book one. This is a book for the man who needs instruction in loving. It has a period at the end of the line, so really emphatic there. Um, let him read it and love, taught by the lines he has read. Art is a thing one must learn, 
for the sailing or rowing of vessels, also for driving a car. Love must be guided by art. A oh, chariot became car. That's really interesting, like especially in the 1950s. Maybe that everyone knew a car was a chariot then, or maybe the automobile industry had reached its influential clause even into the world of classical literature, who knows. Okay, that's very succinct. Everything is like kind of just four lines compared to the other ones, which were longer than four lines. This is Latin, so I'm just gonna put it aside. I'm gonna take it off the table for now. Um, and then finally, uh, the art of love from to from the 1990s and into the 2000s from the 1990s. Here we go. This also has the Latin in it. If any Roman knows nothing about love making, please read this poem and graduate in expertise. Ships and chariots with sails, oars, wheels, reins, speed through technique and control, and the same obtains for love. That's the fifth line. Um, okay, that. That read much nicer this time, like maybe in comparison to the other ones. Actually, I was going to just throw this on the floor immediately because I didn't like it when I tried it before, but it's actually, um, okay. Let's move on to the next part because I feel like I just interrupted that line and then we can compare it with the, with the other ones. As Automedon was Achilles' charioteer and Tiphys earned the right to steer the Argo on Jason's expedition, so I am appointed by Venus as the technician of her art. My lame, my <laughs> lame. My name will live on as Love's Tiphys, Love's Automedon. Tiphys is the captain of the boat of, the, of Jason and the Argonauts. So, and Automedon is the charioteer of Achilles, famous from the Trojan War. Here is the bit where I'm not really vibing with this one. It's all these, what are they called? Caesuras? Is it? When it like cuts, the line ends in the middle of the next line. It makes it feel really choppy um, and also makes it feel like the rhyme is kind of forced, you know, it doesn't neatly come to the end of the, the line. Kind of the, the absolute opposite of this one, where everything felt like super, super neat, like almost too neat the way everything is like, dum dee dum dee dum da dum dee dum dee dum This is like, da dum dee dum dee dum da dum da dum dee dum It's like, it, it's, um, it feels really choppy and I don't know, I don't like it so much. Also, it's the, the number of stresses in each line, um, it seems like it's changes to fit the rhyme. Did I just rhyme? Oh my god. And like in a nice meter as well, like oof, this is infecting my brain. I want to kind of put it down now. There's something I like about the kind of the sense, like um, I am loves Tiphys, I am loves Automedon, right? And also Venus has appointed me. Um, but the word technician also feels totally wrong here. Um, did he talk about technique instead of art? I don't think he did, did he? So technician feels also weirdly too modern and out of place. But yeah, once again, I'm feeling unsure about this one. Let's read F.A. Wright because he's the closest to hand. Automedon could guide his steeds and Tiphys steer the Argo fearless. But I am versed in lover's screeds and Venus knows my skill is peerless. In love I guide men's footsteps on, a Tiphys and Automedon. Okay, that is just a million times better than this one. Um, it sounds so light so playful, so fun, um, because everything in the meter fits kind of perfectly. And the rhyme also doesn't feel forced. Also comparing it to that thing with the Kesuras, right? Like this one ends the lines like properly, you know, like the, the sort of sentence, the phrase ends at the end of the line. So everything is just like super neat. And like, I don't know, if you're gonna go for that kind of like artificial sounding, like old school English, um, meter and rhyme, then I kind of, I guess I prefer it this way compared to here, where it's mixing a sort of free verse style with rhyme. Um, that just doesn't work so well. And this one just sounds more like, I guess, polished, right? Like um, the meter, the meter is really regular. But I did, what this guy said somewhere in his introduction was that Ovid has that kind of really playful light. And I know from other like introductions and stuff, of it is meant to sound really playful and light and fun when you read him. So um, this one just sounds more fun, I guess. Okay, let's try Rolf Humphreys from the 50s. Um, Automedon excelled with the reins in the car of Achilles, Tiphys in Jason's craft, crafty with rudder and sail. Thanks be to Venus, I too deserve the title of master. Master of arts, I might say, versed in the precepts of love. So interesting. The kind of the meaning is the same, but the feeling is so different because there's no rhyme <laughs> is one thing. Um, and also the, the, the lines are, are so much longer. 
Um, and I think that is kind of copying more like the Roman style from, from what I've seen of the Latin. They had the Latin lyric poetry has much longer lines. Um, and I think they had more stresses to each line. So here, I guess this guy is the most literal in the sense of, of meter and sound of, of each line, right? Um, Automaton excelled with the reins in the car of Achilles. Although it does kind of sound like iambic, doesn't it? Like the dum, the dum, the dum. Um, which is like an English thing usually. This one also sounds kind of like tough. I don't know how to say it, like kind of like a tough guy um, and a little bit a little bit dry compared to the the other the other one. So far I'm surprised this one is actually the one that stands out the most even though I think I said at the beginning that I'm not into rhyme being interposed where it doesn't belong and Humphreys is the one who's not doing that at the moment but I didn't, I don't know, it's kind of boring. Well fitted for chariots and pliant reins was Automedon and Tiphys was the helmsman of the Haemonian ship. Me hath Venus set over tender love as master in the art. I shall be called the Tiphys and Automedon, Automedon of love. Okay, so this one is obviously the most literal one. It's in prose um, and it's just, I feel I get this meaning from the other ones, but it's just um, boring, basically. It's not interesting to read. I mean, it is kind of interesting to read, but the poetry is just much... All three of these, I think, conveyed that idea well, that the, the poet or the speaker in the poem is the kind of the master. It can be compared to these mythical, like, sailors or charioteers who are not so famous as love, but were the ones who were guiding the kind of this amazing hero, whether it's Achilles or Jason and, the, and all the heroes on the, on the Argonauts. So, like, I get the ideas from all of these, but this one is, um, even though it's more literal, so I guess it's more interesting in a scholarly way, it's going on the floor because I'm not going to read it. And then finally, Dryden. Let's hope he's not so dry. Cupid indeed is obstinate and wild, a stubborn god, but yet the god's a child. Okay, totally different so far. Easy to govern in his tender age, like fierce Achilles in his pupilage. That hero, born for conquest, Temb trembling stood before the centaur and received the rod. This is totally different. But he did talk about the seamen and their sailing arts and the art guiding the chariot. So he's just like gone off on one. He's like really, um, this is the most, uh, I guess, free translation in the sense that he's kind of gotten the ideas of what was there and changed it to write his own poem, which maybe that just was translation in the 1700s. So I guess for that reason, more than anything, I don't want to read Dryden because it feels less true to Ovid, more like just the ideas of Ovid, but the words of Dryden, if that makes sense, um, which maybe it's a good poem, but it's not the one that I want to read right now. So let's put him on the floor. That leaves us with three potential candidates for my reading. Um, either the 1990s one, which I thought would have been out of the running by now, uh, the 1950s one, which seems kind of like the most, I don't know, the most Roman, like it's really strong, powerful lines that um, like kind of encapsulate a lot of meaning in one single line, but it feels really declarative as well. Like it doesn't feel like light and lilting, like this third one, um, The Lover's Handbook. Um, which is seems like also has been changed a lot in terms of form and meter, but in terms of meaning seems to follow quite accurately what was being said in the original poem, um, judging by, I mean, not by the Latin, but what I've seen so far of the other translations. So yeah, I'm going to move to the next passage now and see how these compare. Let's go back to the Lover's Handbook because I'm the most curious about this one, really. I've just got my library receipt bookmarks everywhere now, all over the place. Tis true that love's a willful lad, and oft rebels against my sway. Okay, so this is actually the Dryden, so this just comes a bit later in the poem, and Dryden kind of rearranged the, the order of what, what, what was written in the Ovid. Tis true that love's a willful lad, and oft rebels against my sway, but youth is never wholly bad, and learns by training to obey. So Chiron once Achilles framed, and his fierce heart by music tamed. Okay, Chiron is the centaur that taught Achilles, um, the great hero and warrior. And here again, the, the poet is comparing himself to like a trainer of a great hero or someone who can guide and instruct someone who's actually stronger and more, and more powerful and magnificent and divine even than he is. Because um, Achilles was half immortal or like, like kind of immortal, but anyway. Let's do another stanza because it continues that same line of thought. 
He who in manhood scared his friends and made his foemen run the faster, now on a form for whipping bends, obedient to his aged master. The hand that laid proud Hector dead, now from the ruler shrinks in dread. So that I think is amazing actually, that last couplet. The hand that laid proud Hector dead, so like, you know, the hand of Achilles, which did this amazing feat of defeating the great hero of Troy. Um, now from the ruler, which the ruler is Chiron, the centaur, shrinks in dread because he's obedient to his master and his master has complete control over him, right? And the sort of the, what's it called? The parallel that's being drawn here is Ovid having mastery over love. I feel like there's a lot in just that couplet because of how it gets built up to, um, which, I, which I like, I like a lot. Now Humphreys of the long Roman sounding lines. Um, love to be sure is wild and often inclines to resent me. Still, he's only a boy, tender and easily swayed. When Achilles was young, Chiron could tame his wild spirit, even could teach his hands how to move over a lyre. He who frightened his foes and frightened his friends just as often dreaded one aged man, so all the ages believe. He would reach out his hands, submissive and meek, for a lashing. Those were the violent hands Hector was later to know. So there you go, you have like that couplet again. So there must be the couplet originally in, in Ovid, I think, which like it builds up to this idea of Hector being defeated by Achilles, but Achilles, the, the same hands being controlled or like being submissive to Chiron the centaur. And that being a metaphor for how the poet has control over love. And that control is something that he can share if you read this book. There's a real kind of sales pitch going on here as well. And now comparing to Michi of the 1990s and his sort of free verse and rhyme combination. Love often fights against me, for he's wild, yet he's also controllable, for he's still a child. Chiron made Achilles expert with the lyre, his cool tuition quenched youth's primitive fire, so that the boy who later became a terror to friends and foes alike stood tame, in front of his aged teacher, so they say, and the hand that Hector would feel one day was held out meekly to be wrapped at his schoolmaster's bidding. Achilles was the apt, and then it goes on to pupil of Chiron. Love is mine. Hmm, okay, so, right. The couplet, which was powerful in both of these, but I think more so in the Lover's Handbook, um, doesn't have anywhere near the same strength here. I feel like that's kind of like one of the key images or like a really strong image that Achilles hand defeating Hector but being submissive to Chiron, being somehow uh, related to this guy's teaching abilities as a, as, a, as a love doctor or whatever. So I feel like through this translation, the power of the poem, presuming that that, po that couplet does exist in the Latin one, and it does seem to um, because of the, fa the way that it's repeated here, and the way that was really built up to really well in both of these. So I just feel like probably that's how it was actually done in the original. And here it's just that, that kind of build up and climax or that kind of climactic image is totally missing um, because of the way it progresses and the way that lines break and kind of rhyme in just random ways. Yeah, it feels forced and I don't really like it. But before I put this one on the floor as well and narrow it down to two, I think what I want to do is, I mean, I want to compare a different part of the poem, not just the opening lines, but unfortunately, because they're like kind of done differently, like and the stanzas are different between all of them, um, it's hard to find a, a break where I can compare them. Obviously, page number won't work. What I can do is go to the end of book one and read the last few lines. So that's what I'm going to do. Read the last few lines of book one for uh, these ones. So let's start with Michi because he's in my hands. That's how it comes about that girls who shy away from decent lads fall cheap into the arms of cads. Ooh, I like that. This part of my task is finished. More remains. Let my boat rest here. I'll drop the anchor chains. Right, so obviously the, the bit about the girls shying away from decent lads and falling cheap into the arms of cads um, sounds fun, but it's the end of something bigger. And then there's like a little paragraph in there where he says this part of my task is finished but like another lesson to teach you but that's the next part so here i'm stopping so i like that that was fine i want to know what the the thing that came before was about the girls you know falling into the hands of cats um sounds interesting 
So she will run away from an honest man and go flying off to the safer embrace of some inferior clown. <laughs> That's totally different. Um, part of my work remains, but a third of the labor is finished. Here, let an anchor be thrown, holding my vessel secure. Oh, I kind of like that one. Even though, like, I'm kind of used to the rhyming now, so it feels like something's missing without it. Which is weird, because I said at the beginning how I don't like rhyme being inserted where it didn't originally exist. I like off to the safer embrace of some inferior clown. Something kind of bitter and petty about that, which is very nice. Um, and interesting that when he says, part of my work remains is like exactly the same as this one, I think word for word. But he says, a third of the labor is finished. So kind of signaling that there's three books, three big parts to this poem. Um, Here let an anchor be thrown. I really like this one. In this case, it's kind of hard to judge between these two, but I think this one just about comes up on top. And then finally, the lover's handbook. Let's see what you have to say about this. Yes, that is off the reason why Girls leave good men with rogues to lie. And now a moment's breathing space. Half of our course is safely done. We've reached the turn post of the race. The other half's not yet begun. So cast the hawser overside and let our bark at anchor ride. Okay, so yeah, in this case, I don't, I don't really like that. I feel why say in six lines what you could say in two um, when these ones did that pretty well, like the boat metaphor. Why did we need to like kind of extend it. I suppose it's something to do with the way that he's decided to break these into these, um, to break things up into these um, six line stanzas with this specific A, B, A, B, C, C pattern um, because kind of the C, C usually is kind of like the conclusion to the A, B, A, B, like whatever's building up. It's like, I don't know, I guess it feels satisfying, like you've reached the ending of like a kind of, like everyone's got like a little kind of build up and climax and ending. Um, whereas the, the kind of the build up and climax was the thing to do with girls going into the arms of rogues instead of good men. Um, and then the, the kind of the neat ending doesn't fit that. It's just a totally different thing saying like, let's stop, let's stop for a bit. I've finished this lesson. I've got another lesson to teach you. And here's a metaphor about a boat right so to fit all that into just two lines would wouldn't answer the first like kind of building up of the a b a b part so i can kind of understand why he decided to just make it a whole separate stanza like expand that into six lines um it does seem though not very true to ovid right like he's made this form um this like very 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 rigid form and he's sticking to it but he's like kind of twisting the original poetry um, to, to make it work. So I don't really like that so much, even though I, I get it. That said, um, based on what I've read before of Ovid and what I've read like other people say in terms of like, you know, the introductions or whatever, like there should, the way that Ovid should sound is playful and witty and like kind of flippant often. Um, and yet with this very meticulous structure. And in terms of that kind of, yeah, style and structure and just feeling, then this one does seem to definitely be on top of the other two. This one just seems kind of sloppy in the structure, I think, because like mixing free verse and rhyme doesn't really work for me and doesn't feel like it, it fits Ovid and like it doesn't have this kind of build up and release that you get really nicely in this one and even this one. Um, and then this one, yeah, The Art of Love by Rolf Humphreys is just kind of dry and, and a bit dull and sounds more like something like the Iliad should sound, like kind of commanding big lines that they have like a nice rhythm to them. They're not like the prose, but they are more prosy than the lines here and here. Um, so I don't know, I guess it's weird, but I guess it's actually this one. I guess this is the one I'm going to read, The Lover's Handbook. Um, and I'm quite happy about that, but also I'm kind of intimidated because I really did not expect I was going to pick a book which had a very kind of like English language derived structure and meter and rhyme and everything, you know, imposed on this Latin poetry, which had, you know, was written in a totally different way. 
but like it's just fun to read i suppose and that's just another thing whenever i'm reading anything i want to have a good time I, it's not like my main focus isn't a scholarly endeavor although that might come as a surprise to people who've come this far in the video um but but yeah i want to actually enjoy reading the poem and this just felt the most enjoyable to read so so yeah i'm gonna read the lover's handbook and farewell to uh, james mitchie and a farewell to rolf humphreys i am going to maybe compare a few more things um, as I go on. But for now, I'm very much looking forward to discovering why Alvin got exiled and what the big deal was about to Rome <laughs> when it came to the Ars Amatoria, um, or the Lover's Handbook, as it's been translated here. And yeah, honestly, this has been really fun, like seeing the differences and how each one had its strengths and weaknesses. And uh, if you let me know down in the comments if you think I picked the wrong one based on the, the lines I've given you, if you would have picked a different one, or if you think I made the right choice with the, the Lover's Handbook. Or let me know if you also have struggles over translations when it comes to favorite authors in different languages or any other good translation stories. Just put that all down in the comments and we'll chat about it. But for now, I'm gonna go read this over lunch. So thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one. Bye.